a dangerous area of face please look at the board this is the upper lip right this is the upper lip these are the ala of the nose what are they ala of the nose that is the lower part of the nose and here you call it the upper lip or the superior labium and here you call this area philtrum this is called philtrum okay so this area that is the upper lip philtrum and the ala of the nose it is called as the dangerous area of face and certain portion of the cheeks you know which are more by the side of the ala of the nose so you have got upper lip you have got the philtrum the space present between the ala of the nose and upper lip and little portions of this sides of the cheek here if there is any infection for example if there is a pustule or there is pimples you know if there is any pustule or if there is any pimple and that gets infected because when you have pimples people are going on pricking those pimples so what is happening the infection can spread from this portion of the face to the cavernous sinus the infection can spread to the cavernous sinus from this portion of the face upper lip philtrum all of the nose and the medial portion and the cheek the medial parts of the cheek just by the side of the nose the infection from this area can go to the cavernous sinus via emissary veins that are present and that's why you call this as the dangerous area of face dangerous layer of scalp or dangerous area of scalp you know scalp the full form skin connective tissue epineurosis loose areola tissue and pericranium the fourth layer the fourth layer of the scalp which is also called as loose areola tissue is the most dangerous area of the scalp why it is dangerous because there are emissary veins present in this layer so what will happen the emissary veins are the valveless veins which are connecting extra cranial veins with the intra cranial dural venous sinuses now you know we learned about the paired and unpaired dural venous sinuses you remember the cavernous sinus the superior sagittal sinus transverse sinus sigmoid sinus you know these are all the sinuses which are present within the cranium so the infection of the fourth layer of the scalp can enter into the dural venous sinuses via the emissary veins so we should be very careful imagine if there is a road traffic accident okay there is a nail which got pricked in the scalp then after 2 3 months you see a person had thrown fits what happened so you will feel just one small nail uh, got i uh, got pricked by a small nail and that's all that was that is what the patient will tell after he becomes you know he recovers his consciousness and then when you ask him he will be telling yes that day when that nail pricked some 2 3 drops of blood came and that was all rusted but i thought Uh, it is of uh, no use to go to a doctor, or it is not necessary. I have not even taken a TT injection. So please understand. Even if the injury is small, it can cause serious effects. Okay? Why? The loose area tissue of scalp. It is directly connected to the dural venous sinuses because of the presence of emissary veins, which are valveless. So spread of infection is through these emissary veins. They are blamed for the spread of the infection. Thank you. Emissary veins. Emissary veins are the valveless veins which are connecting the extra cranial veins with the intra dural venous sinuses. The extra cranial veins, that is the veins which are present outside the cranium, are connected to the intra dural venous sinuses. 
Now you know you have got dural venous sinuses paired and unpaired, like cavernous sinus, sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, you know. So many the superior sagittal sinus we have already learned. So the venous sinuses which are present inside the cranium, so these are called the dural venous sinuses which are intracranial, they are connected to the extracranial veins which is possible by these emissary veins. So emissary veins are those veins which are connecting the extracranial veins with the intradural venous sinuses. If you see these emissary veins, they are valveless. So the blood can flow bidirectional because they are valveless. Also, the emissary veins, they equalize the pressure in the veins. If you see parietal foramina, see the parietal foramen. Through the parietal foramen, there is one emissary vein which is passing through this parietal foramina that opens into the superior sagittal sinus which is opening into the superior sagittal sinus passing through the parietal foramen. So this is the parietal emissary vein and passing through the mastoid foramen passing through the mastoid foramen there is another emissary vein which is opening into the sigmoid sinus this is opening into the sigmoid sinus like that you have got so many emissary veins in the foramen lacedum the foramen lacedum the foramen ovale and the foramen cecum these are all the different foramen of the skull which are transmitting the emissary veins to them okay this veins which we are talking extracranial they are present in the loose areolar tissue of the scalp so the infection of the loose areolar tissue of the scalp via the emissary veins which is basically extracranial now can pass into the sinuses which are intradural sinuses and then infection which is extracranial can become intracranial. Thank you. Venous return that is the blood, the deoxygenated blood from different parts of the bodies is drained into the right atrium of the heart via the veins. So what are the factors? which are responsible for this returning back of the venous blood to the right atrium of the heart. That's what we are going to discuss now. First it is overflow of the blood from the capillaries. So you have got overflow of the blood from capillaries. Continuously blood is flowing through the capillaries because you know arteries are under the arterial blood, the arterial blood is flowing under pressure, maybe systolic, maybe diastolic, but it is always under pressure and this arterial blood is going into the terminal arterioles and meta arterioles and finally it is going either into the capillaries or sinusoids continuously. So this will push the blood in the venules into veins. So like that the blood starts moving from the capillaries and sinusoids into the venules. Then you have got the negative intrathoracic pressure. So the intrathoracic pressure is negative. So if you see the blood, it ascends up in the inferior vena cava from the abdomen to the right atrium of the heart which is present in the thorax because of the negative intrathoracic pressure. Also there are also there are muscles, you know, the enabling the increased venous return. What do you mean by muscles enable the increased venous return? We learned peripheral heart. There is one central heart that is the cardiac and the peripheral heart or the peripheral pump which you call soleus, that is the muscle of the pump. This muscle soleus has lots of venous sinuses and once there is contraction of this muscle, the blood is, 
the blood in the veins it is again drained towards the the blood in the veins is again drained towards the right atrium of the heart it is ascending up because of the muscular contractions and also there are deep fascia you know the deep fascia which enables the increased venous return and if you see the gravity also helps in increased venous return if you take the superior vena cava i said the blood the blood from the head and neck it flows down in it flows down in line with gravity in the superior vena cava from superior vena cava it is going into the right atrium of the heart inferior vena cava is having blood that is sucked into the thorax because of negative intrathoracic pressure whereas the blood in the superior vena cava that is from the head and neck will flow down into the right atrium in line with the gravity then you got interesting feature that is vena comitentis comitentis now what do you mean by this vena comitentis if you see a single artery okay this artery is having in its close approximation one or two veins the continuous pulsation of this artery is helping or aiding in the venous return so the blood in the vein is moving towards the heart and again the temperature you know arterial blood is warm venous blood is relatively it is cooler so what is happening the temperature is also being shared now if you take testis testis is supplied by testicular artery surrounding the testicular artery there is pampani form plexus of veins what are these veins doing they are stealing the temperature from the testicular artery the arterial blood which reaches the testis is relatively cool you are understanding this is because of this pampani form plexus so that's what we are trying to tell about the vena comitentis the vena comitentis are nothing but pair of veins or more than a pair they can be which are in close association with an artery where they take the temperature from the arterial blood and also the continuous pulsations of the artery is draining the blood which is present in this veins towards the right atrium of the heart is that fine thank you venules we are going to learn about venules what is the difference between the venules and the veins that also we are going to learn so when we talk about venules okay what are venules venules are the smallest veins into which the capillaries drain venules are the smallest veins into which the capillaries drain okay if you see the lumen it is 20 to 30 microns you can take the circumference of a venule okay if you see this venules you know you have got the microscopic structure we are talking you got endothelium that is a single layer of squamous cells So here we are in the single layer of squamous cells, which are resting on a basement membrane. Yes, so this is the basement membrane, and then you have got tunica adventitia, which is made up of collagen fibers. This is tunica adventitia, which is made up of collagen fibers that are running longitudinally. So what are you having in the tunica adventitia? We are having collagen fibers which are running longitudinally. Okay. in the tunica adventitia of venule and then you have got some cells which are very flat okay and these cells are called pericytes these are called pericytes in very close approximation with the endothelium of the venule you are having these cells called pericytes and if you see this venule what is the difference between vein and a venule you know veins they carry in your blood and when we talk about venules these we said the capillaries drain into the smallest veins and they are called venules especially when you take the post capillary venules 
especially when you are trying to talk about the post capillary venules they are having the capacity for exchange of gases they are permeable the post capillary venules they are permeable for the nutrients or the substances to pass from the blood into the neighboring tissues okay from the blood into the neighboring tissues even the leukocytes can pass even the leukocytes can pass from them that is from the lumen of a venule to the surrounding tissue thank you